from Pakistan. Uh, I work at the Digital Rights Foundation. Uh, I work as a program manager for the Cyber Harassment Helpline. Um, I will ask all our panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, but first, I just want to give an overview of what this session uh, is about, what our intended con uh, what our intended aims are out of this dis discussion. Um, we've seen that um, over time, um, lots of states uh, use internet shutdowns um, and uh, laws to um, you know, control which platforms, which social media platforms, and uh, you know, digital uh, uh, digital services are available in countries uh, for various for various reasons. They sometimes decide to ban them or block them for uh, certain amounts of uh, certain periods of time. Um, this can happen in times of crisis or not. Um, and on the other hand, we've seen examples where certain tech companies have blocked and restricted their operations and content in areas where they did not agree with the political actions of the state. So you have um, blockages and um, holding back of services or digital services from both sides, from both uh, states and governments and from the tech companies themselves. Um, but in the midst of all of this, it's always the citizens who are made to suffer at the end. Um, they're not involved in the actual political, or they, may, they might not be involved in the actual uh, political making decisions. Um, and it's not necessary that they even support those moves, but they are the ones who at the end of the day are deprived of access to uh, financial financial systems to social media entertainment, especially healthcare and educational systems. Um, so, um, which connect them to the rest of the world. And that's obviously an infringement of the, on their rights, their digital rights, um, their human rights. But also uh, the other consequences of this is that people from uh, people who aren't uh, in that country, uh, we are also from you know all parts of the world, we are also the ones who suffer because we um, lose very important information, very important uh, you know uh, live information that we can get from citizens on the ground. Um, you know whether it's through uh, live streaming or you know uh, citizen journalists taking pictures, taking videos of the events that are happening or transpiring in that country at the time, especially when it's a crisis, political crisis going on or even a humanitarian crisis. So, which is why I wanted to put up this discussion and um, I've invited our panelists who I think will be will be able to give us a lot of insight um, into what, um, what rules or um, what frameworks should govern both the governments or states that impose the, these uh, shutdowns or bans and tech companies decisions whenever they decide to uh, withhold their services. Um, so I'm going to uh, call out each of our panelists one by one and ask them to give a short introduction of themselves. Um, and I hope that I pronounce your name right. If I don't, I'm very sorry and please correct me. Um, I'm going to start off with Mona. Thank you, Haira. Uh, my name is Munish Taye. I'm working at Hamle, the Arab Center for the Advancement of Social Media. I'm leading their advocacy and communication, and I'm glad to join you today in this session. Thank you. Thank you, Mona. Uh, Tanzil, do we have you here? Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Tanzil. I work as a uh, um, represent, community representative for Mozilla Foundation, and I work as a software engineer. And I do advocacy work in uh, the Indian administered Kashmir related to the uh, you know digital rights and internet shutdowns. So I look forward to joining this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Tanzil. Uh, Iliska. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eliska Pirkova. I work as a global freedom of uh, freedom expression lead at Access Now. Apologies, uh, and it's a great pleasure to be here today. Thank you, and Nigga. Hi everyone, um, I am Nigat Dad from uh, Pakistan. I run Digital Rights Foundation uh, and I also sit on the uh, Matters Independent Oversight Board. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, so I'm just gonna start off by um, posing a question, first of all, to Tanzil. Um, so we've, uh, you know, limiting di limiting digital services is obviously a major major disruptor in the lives and well beings uh, of ordinary citizens. But what actions by a state or government 
can possibly justify imposing such restrictions on the residents on all the residents of such a country. Mm. Uh, so I can't think of any reason that can justify you know uh, imposing restrictions on on all the residents of a country. Maybe there could be some cases where where there's a chance of violence or there's a chance of uh, there's a threat to human life. But in in that specific area, some restrictions could be imposed, and not not and and though you know I, I don't think internet should be, you know, shut down as a whole. But maybe some services could be restricted. But uh, I have not um, you know heard of any such situation where uh, the reason for shutting down the internet was uh, you know threat to human life or there there is a conflict between two communities or something like. Most of the cases where which I have seen and experienced is that the that when the people are against the government, their decisions, or when the people are living under occupation, like in case of Kashmir, then the government, you know, shuts down the internet just to, you know, stop the spread of information and just to st stop people from, you know, sharing whatever is happening with them on ground. So, yeah, I, I can't think of any other reason. I don't think it should be shut down as a whole. Thank you. Sure. Can you speak a little more about uh this situation that you are facing in Kashmir right now. What is your personal experience of uh, governments uh, yeah. dabbling in internet shutdowns or yeah. specific specific platforms? So uh, one uh, experience that I remember is when um, on in 2019, the internet was shut for around three months um, and not just the internet, other you know communication services, including the phone, SMS, even the post office was, you know, shut. So uh, the reason for that was uh, the government decided to, you know, um, remove uh, one article from the Indian constitution and, you know, integrate uh, Kashmir with, with India. And uh, they, before doing that, they shut down the internet. There was no, you know, uh, violence happening. There was, uh, you know, there was nothing uh, that could, you know, uh, justify shutting down the internet, but the government shut it so that people uh, don't, you know, assemble or people don't get to know what is happening around. The people that are not living in Kashmir, they don't get to know what's happening with the people in Kashmir there. And I was not in Kashmir then and I was not able to, you know, communicate with my family for at least three months. And and not just me, thousands of people that were not in Kashmir, they, they didn't know what, what's happening with the, what's happening there on ground. Not even the media persons were allowed. Uh, the journalists were not allowed uh, in Kashmir, and all the you know communication services were shut. So I think that that is one of the example of um, you know the uh, the government um, you know suppressing the voice of people who 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 don't have uh, the authority, who don't have the power in the government or you know in 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 the uh, in anywhere in any organization, but only source of uh, only medium that they have to speak that they have to share uh, their experience is the internet and the government shuts down that as well so, yeah that, that's that's the experience that i've had mm -hmm. uh mona i think I'd, i'll pose the same question to you are there any situations where you feel like uh you know states or governments are justified or is it do you agree with them zero on this and what is has your experience been so in Palestine, like the context is a bit different. Uh, we are not talking about uh, internet shutdown, uh, but rather we are talking about more of uh, restrictions on uh, the freedom of expression, how people are expressing themselves on the social media platforms, accessing the, like specific uh, digital services. Um, for example, we can talk about accessing PayPal, accessing Venmo, which is on oh, like owned by PayPal, but also uh the social media platforms where people can express themselves where they can share the documentations of human rights violations that they are exposed to and in in cases where people are living under colonization or in a, in a colonial context like palestine it's a bit uh, tricky to give um, adjustments or to give excuses why governments uh, whether it's like military occupation governments or like authorities local authorities to um, to deny people their right to freedom of expression. We can't give excuses for this. People should be able to share their uh, their opinions, the documentation of human rights violations that they are exposed to on the ground, on the social media, freely, openly, uh, but also with a quality and affordable internet. And here we can talk more about the colonial context in Palestine, where 
it's like, yeah, we're not talking about cut off the internet, but we are talking about a context where Palestinians have no control over the infrastructure, the, in the internet or the ICT infrastructure in Palestine, which means if the Israeli government decide to cut off the internet or prevent us from having access to the internet, they can do that easily because the Israeli government is controlling the whole ICT infrastructure in Palestine, which denies us as Palestinians our access to affordable quality internet um, in the occupied Palestinian territory. That said, that doesn't mean our communication on the social media when we have, I mean, um, internet connectivity to the internet, that doesn't mean that we are sharing our opinions freely or the documentations of the human rights violations freely. Uh, it also means that the certain governments, which is in our context, the Israeli government, have or practices its power to put pressure on different tech companies to oppress Palestinian voices as they are oppressing us on the ground. They are also oppressing our voices on the social media platforms. In 2015, the Israeli authorities, they established what they call the Israeli cyber unit, which works systematically to uh, monitor uh, Palestinian content send requests to the social media platforms to take down the Palestinian content and oppress the Palestinian narrative in the online platforms. If we just keep in mind that when you are living in a colonial uh, in a colonial context, then you don't have or you are the weaker the weaker community. You don't have access to the fair access to the uh, international media coverage. Uh, which means that social media platforms are uh, an open platform for you where you can share your narrative and your stories freely and openly. But this is not the case when we have the Israeli cyber unit, which started in uh, that like the no in numbers in 2016, they sent around 2,400 requests to the social media companies, and they increase their work till in 2019, which is the most recent numbers that we have, they send around 20,000 requests to the social media companies. And when we say the word request, we mean a communication message. We don't, we don't mean like a piece of content. At each communication message might have thousands of posts to the social media companies. So based on what the Israeli cyber unit acknowledged, they said that is that social media companies are accepting 90% of or approving 90% of those requests, which is basically uh, censoring Palestinian voices. And this means that the narrative on the internet is not fairly representing the Israelis and Palestinians, but rather it has like a mono narrative where the Israeli narrative is stayed online and the Palestinian narrative is oppressed and it's being censored and taken down. And the latest uh, report by the BSR, which is the Business Social Responsibility Network, which came as a result of the Oversight Board recommendation to have um, to have investigation on how they are moderating the Arabic Palestinian content and the Israeli Hebrew content, confirms that there is bias on how uh, Facebook are treating the Arabic Palestinian content and how they are over moderating or over enforcing that content and how they are under enforcing the Israeli Hebrew content, which means that whether you have internet cut off or whether you have censorship on your voices, at the end of the day, you have limited access or you are denied of sharing your narrative, your story and your content on the internet, which means like one party has, uh, has more space than the other. And this is like a reflection of the human rights violations that we have on the ground. I think you are muted. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, that's an interesting that point that you picked up uh, about infrastructure, about having access to and owning infrastructure and, and then what um, benefits that can have. It's not just about the access to the internet, but um, um, affordability as well. Um, Nikit, would you like to add something to this discussion? I mean, uh, we've had internet shutdowns and social media platforms being banned here in Pakistan as well. Um, so in some situations, do you think that that would be justified? Um, there are various reasons given by the Pakistan government and what is your opinion? 
Yeah, um, well, I think uh, what I, I agree what uh, Tanzil said and what Mona already mentioned. And I think uh, we um, we really need to uh, first see the context, uh, you know, who's the more powerful, you know, the I think we can talk about justifications. I mean, the, the governments and states are the more powerful than users. And uh, especially in the uh, in crisis situation or in the in conflict zones, they are the ones who set the rules they are the ones who make the rules and regulations and laws and justify these uh, these shutdowns or uh, or as mona mentioned you know how uh, cyber unit it's not just uh, we are talking about one uh, one jurisdiction but you know law enforcement around the world uh, have uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, power and access to the to the companies and asking for not only for users data but asking for uh, uh, you know, taking down content. And I think this is something, and I'm, I'm, thank you, Mona, for mentioning uh, about the uh, decision that we at the oversight board uh, gave uh, um, uh, on in, in Al Jazeera case. Um, but, uh, but it's basically based on all of your work that you all have been doing for so long, holding companies accountable around being more transparent and accountable to the users and, and transparent in terms of what, what they are taking down how they are uh, how they are uh, responding to the governments and law enforcement's requests. Um, so uh, governments can come up with their own ideas around rules and regulations. We have seen this in our own jurisdiction. We are seeing uh, all over the world, uh, and they are justifying these shutdowns uh, in the name of. Uh, national security or public order or uh, you know when they uh, and and they try to say that they they there can be political turmoil or you know there is a threat to public at large or there is a threat to you know other actors and that's why we are take we, we are shutting down internet but the thing is that uh, they, they, there is a framework available uh, which many countries have signed on to and it's the international human rights framework work, different treaties and convention, ICCPR is one, and so-called democracies, you know, are the ones who have not only signed on to it, they have ratified. So this basically, it, it, it tells uh, the government uh, and states that if there are certain things that they want to do, uh, they can do so under, uh, and there is this threshold. The threshold is what? L uh, legitimate aim should be there in the sense uh, that there should be an appropriate legal framework that authorizes, uh, uh, you know, such uh, internet shutdowns uh, uh, to to take place for, for, for some purposes, but those purposes should be very, very specific. It's And, and this principle of legality, um, it's a fundamental principle of international human rights that requires any interference with human rights to be prescribed by law. Um, in addition to uh, to that, any interference with right to access, with right to free speech must be necessary and proportionate. We have been seeing disproportionate what Tanzil was basically saying that shutting down the entire internet, blanket bans, blanket blocking, uh, that really doesn't justify government's actions. Uh, so any shutdown by the state which has an impact on its citizens' fundamental rights must demonstrate in specific and individualized fashion, the precise nature of the threat. What threat they are trying to address? Public order, national security, something that we all have been seeing how governments interpret all these ambiguous terms. So I think the, uh, uh, and, and, and of course, proportionality and necessity, all these frameworks are there. It's actually the political will we are talking about. It's not that the governments don't know. They don't, they, they have ratified all these things. They know that there is this threshold, but how much willingness is there to follow, I think is a question. All right, thank you. And just because uh, this discussion is headed that way, and Mona, you've already touched on this before, um, do you have an idea of what is the fine line? What extent do you think that companies, uh, you know, social media companies or other tech companies, what are what's that fine line where they should um, comply with the laws uh, or requests by government um, whenever they want to do, you know, um, restrict some of their activities? Where is the um, when is the action 
um, should, when is the action should be taken by those tech companies? Um, you know, what's the, uh, what's that time when they should say, okay, we don't agree with the laws that you're uh, trying to implement. We don't agree with the rights of the people that you're trying to do, uh, suppress. Um, and we're not going to comply with whatever you're saying anymore. And it might be better at this moment for us to back out. Is this a question for me or for Nigat? For, for Mona, yes. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, actually, I think uh, the baseline that we start our uh, discussions, our advocacy with the social media companies usually is the international human rights law, as well as the human rights and business principles. Uh, those are the starting lines and uh, the reality, uh, however, the reality is a bit different because uh, how social media companies operate um, and how governments are sending those requests reflects something different. It reflects the political, economical uh, interests for the social media companies as well as for the government. Uh, I can give you a clear example on this. In, uh, in, in the Arab region, for example, in 2010-2011, when the uh, Arab revolution started, the young people in the Arab region, they thought that they are now escaping the authoritarianism, like the regime authoritarianism that, that they have been living um, under for decades. But then when they escaped that and they start, or started organizing and mobilizing themselves online and reflecting that on the streets, they, they were um, shocked by new authoritarianism, which is the digital authoritarianism from the social media companies, where social media companies have also the community standards that they are applying for this content. Uh, the, the, the fine line that we are mentioning or that social media should take responsibility when it comes to moderating their content is how this content or does this content um, cause or could be reflected or extended to a real world harm. Like in the case of Palestine, Israel, like whenever they are over moderating that the, the human rights violations that Palestinians are exposed to, and then they are under moderating the Israeli hate speech, violent speech and incitement against Palestinians and Arabs, which basically is reflected or is extended to the, um, to the offline space or to our real life as a form of violence in our real life, um, then we can see that there's a problem because they are taking down evidence on war crime where the ICC, where any, any party, any human rights the entity would investigate the war crimes, would go back to this, uh, to this human rights documentation, while the other uh, incitement, hate speech and, uh, and violent speech against Arabs and Palestinians, which in other cases uh, created stereotyping and labeling, like the case of Kashmir or Myanmar or other cases, it, it creates labels and stereotypes uh, against like certain communities. It stayed online because this was part of a powerful government that sent that, those requests against or toward uh, to the social media companies to oppress more the, uh, the marginalized communities. Uh, because as marginalized communities or as colonized communities, we don't have the power. And if we just think about the purchasing ads power, Israel has a purchasing ad like uh, Israel has purchasing ad power equivalent to Palestine, Jordan and Egypt combined all together. And this is based on the numbers in 2019. And when we are talking only about like the purchasing ad power, then we are talking about like one of the major things that operates the social media platforms. They are relying on business and on, on selling ads basically as part of their business model. Then here we are talking about the political economical interests for the companies as well as the government. If we take another case, which is the Russia-Ukraine case, and I think Eliska would be much more expert in this rather, uh, more than me. But also the power dynamics there and how social media companies took aside this uh, or stood with uh, Ukraine against Russia, how they took strict action to moderate the content during the time of the war. It reflects also how they followed the governmental or the big governments, powerful governments like the US government uh, direction in taking aside beside uh, Ukraine uh, rather than staying in neutral, quote unquote, which uh, also came late. Like now we are not negotiating 
if those measures were good or bad, but also they came late because for a long time, civil society in Ukraine were, ta were, were demanding tech companies to take action to protect people there. They never were serious about that until the government took action, took strict actions, they took strict actions. So it's how they are operating. It's it doesn't reflect the reality or the uh, the desired uh, uh, thoughts about how uh, they should have uh, work with with certain communities and with certain uh, countries. Mm -hmm. And um, Elishka, you've also uh, co-authored uh, a declaration on principles for content and government. Uh, content and platform governance. Um, so I'd like you to hear what your um, experience or uh, opinion is on you know, how tech platforms should behave in times like this. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you again for having me. And perhaps I would like to also quickly respond to your first initial question about whether measures such as uh, arbitrary blocking of websites or internet shutdowns could ever be justified uh, in the light of international human rights law. And very short answer to that is no. And uh, precisely due to the fact that such an arbitrary measure under no circumstances can uh, meet the proportionality and necessity test and the legality requirements that was already mentioned by previous speakers. And this is not only opinion of Access Now, this is also opinion of a number of international human rights monitoring bodies, including the special rapporteurs or media freedom representative of the OSCE, um, uh, but also actually European Court of Human Rights, who elaborated on uh, what criteria have to be met if the state has to restore and then it's questionable, again, on what basis to blocking websites. Um, and there were recent judgments, especially in 2020, uh, issued by the court that condemned arbitrary blocking of websites. Um, so um, just very quickly back to your question, and Mona has already raised a couple of very important issues. Uh, indeed, Access Now launched during IGF here in Ethiopia, the Declaration on Principles uh, on Content Governance and Platform Responsibility in Times of Crisis. Um, and I also would like to remind to everyone that it's not only about uh, platforms or private actors' responsibility, who of course have the responsibility, especially under United Nations guiding principles, but it's also also about the state positive obligations to protect individuals against interferences that unjustifiably violate the basic human rights. Um, and so uh, I will touch upon the responsibilities of platforms in a minute, but I really want to get this across um, because we often see, especially in the cases of internet shutdowns, that the basis such as national security or even uh, the efforts to protect the individuals against the spread of disinformation on online hate speech are being invoked as a justifying ground for ordering these arbitrary measures. Um, and of course, this is just uh, abusive practice by states uh, that cannot meet any requirements under international human rights law. And a similar trend can be observed also when states actually arbitrarily criminalize different acts of speech, such as disinformation or very vague terminology, such as fake news, that then enables to actually silence the voices of vulnerable groups, activists, um, and others in the online environment. Going back to your original question, what the platforms can do? Well, they can do much more than they are doing right now. Um, we often see very knee-jerk, ad hoc uh, responses to uh, crisis, usually at the moment when the crisis escalates, and when there is an ongoing public and political pressure, pressure on platforms to finally start taking steps in order to create more safer online environment, uh, especially for those who are impacted by crisis, and that's pretty much everyone. In our declaration, we took the approach where we divided our set of recommendations to what platforms have to do before crisis, what they are required to do during crisis, and what kind of steps should be taken once the crisis uh, slowly de-escalate. And I want to emphasize that we are not trying to promote a hard end of crisis because there is no such a thing. Um, our recommendations are very much based on the due diligence safeguards and obligations that platforms should comply to, comply with, and that's precisely because we want platforms to mitigate the risks that directly stem from their systems and processes, such as algorithmic content moderation, content curation, but also 
the resources they invest into human uh, into content moderation and their content moderators, whether enough languages are being represented, whether these content moderators have a proper understanding of social, political, and historical context of the country. And these are the issues that have been flagged by civil societies for a very, very long time, but we still see a very little progress in the field. Um, for us, one of the main tools that the platforms absolutely have to deploy is different uh, risk assessment measures that are able, whether that's an ex ante human rights impact assessment of their systems that they deploy, uh, but also uh, meaningful transparency criteria into the changes of their content governance policies, which is something we saw precisely in the case of Ukraine when pat platforms started adopting different carve outs from content governance policies uh, in order to create more safer environments but at the same time being very non-transparent about those changes and how they're being implemented. And indeed, we often see platforms responding much faster in the areas where is that regulatory pressure and where there is a lot of political attention, especially from the Western world, in comparison to other parts of the world, especially in the global south, where we unfortunately have to observe a lot of negligence from platforms when it comes to adequate response mechanisms to crisis. And the final point that I would like to raise what platforms can do is uh, maybe to elaborate more on the meaningful engagement with civil society organizations and trusted partners that operate in areas that are suffering of crisis or other challenging circumstances. We often see platforms engaging at the moment when it's too late. Um, so uh, without developing any proper system of, for instance, quarterly consultations, or uh, follow up mechanisms on recommendations that the trusted partners and organizations with relevant expertise keep flagging to platforms long time ahead of the escalation of crisis. Um, and there are no proper follow up mechanism in place to see whether recommendations that are being delivered to platforms are actually properly addressed and translated into their content governance policies applicable during the time of crisis. Uh, our declaration puts forward a number of recommendations that the system could actually get better and the system of consultation could be truly effective. Um, and uh, again, these consultations cannot start at the moment when the crisis escalates, but should be put in place already before the escalation occurs and also in the post-crisis phase. Um, I'll stop there and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to, so some of the things that were highlighted in this declaration that uh, Lishka has co-authored co um, is that there should be um, an, an equitable, uh, fair and consistent approach to engaging, um, that there should be more greater transparency whenever uh, tech companies or social media platforms receive requests from governments, um, that, the, you know, transparency should be, you know, is paramount. Um, any request should be, you know, government, they should disclose any government requests. Um, and of course, that there should be a, a fair and impartial uh, way of responding to content moderation. Um, and especially, uh, I think you've also mentioned uh, something about language, um, you know, not just focusing on English, but on, uh, you know, giving higher priority to non-English languages. So Tenzil, my question to you would be, um, in situations, you know, what is your experience in Kashmir? What would you like for tech companies to um, engage in more whenever you felt like, you know, the governments or states were, uh, the government or state was um, trying to uh, pose restrictions too much? How should tech companies respond instead? Where have you seen that gap? So, um, I think, uh... You know, internet is a global resource and, and um, the tech companies need to have a set of guidelines and principles to follow and, you know, not just, uh, you know, blindly implement the government dictates. So as, as we are seeing in the conflict zones and the, and the, you know, regions under occupation, people do not have uh, authority or decision making and, and the, you know, ruling governments make uh, every effort to suppress people, you know, both online and offline. <laughs> so um, I, I think tech companies need to understand that I think they already know, but they don't care. So uh, and and they need to make exceptions, you know, in case of the regions, you know, they, which are under conflict, like they didn't like, uh, you know, Mona mentioned that, you know, there, there was an exception uh, in case of Ukraine. So I think that exception has to be there in in every case, in, in the cases where which are, you know, conflict zones like Palestine, Kashmir, Myanmar and many other regions where 
government are against you know, the ruling governments or, or the or, you know occupiers are against the, the people living there in that region so uh, in 2019 or 18 i don't exactly remember there were around 1 million tweets uh, were removed by twitter because the the you know indian government dictated them to do so and and there was no you know uh, there was no uh, you know option to appeal or or to you know uh, tell twitter not to delete or, or to revoke the you know uh, the the ban that they had imposed so um, and also recently in past uh, i think in last one year in 2022 we found that around you know 160 um, uh, at least 160 accounts that are critical of uh, you know india's actions in kashmir they were suspended by the um, by the twitter or most of them were withheld uh, you know you cannot access them if you are in india if your location is set to india and in last month, we found out that you know if you, you if you if you change your location from India to another country, we used to access those accounts. Now, if you uh, change your account to any other country, you 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 still won't be able to access those accounts. You know, which are withheld in India. So uh, yeah, I think uh, you know as as Nighat also mentioned that understanding the context is important when you are you know moderating the content online. And as we believe, you know, internet is open and accessible for all. And, and I think it is the responsibility of tech companies, you know, dominating the internet to keep it that way. Collaboration uh, could be one of the, you know, ways, collaboration with, you know, civil society organizations could be one of the ways to, you know, sort help when, when asked by government authorities to censor certain kind of, you know, content or people online. So I, I think, civil society and the people uh, living in that region need to be involved and and not not, not just communicating with the government authorities that way we can you know better moderate the content online thank you okay yeah. so Hi, um yeah. Can I just add to what Tanzil said? I think it's uh, we have been saying, uh, you know, how how much transparency uh, and accountability is important for both tech companies and states. Uh, more for tech companies because uh, states are more powerful than the tech companies, and tech companies uh, are the ones which are not only powerful but rich. And uh, and users uh, in an ideal world, sh users should be the center of uh, you know all the decisions that they are making but uh, but in actual world that's basically uh, that's not happening uh, and I think that's why uh, several uh, civil society organizations digital rights organizations I've been working for them you are working at DRF you know like the it's been a decade that we are we have been saying the same thing over and over and over again and uh, now uh, you know other organizations are also joining in around the world and it's basically the same uh, concerns that you know uh, folks have been raising I think it's uh, again I would say it's the will but at the same time I think uh, it, we uh, 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 we need several solutions you know what we are seeing by the governments uh, are, are that they are in the in the name of holding tech companies accountable they are coming up with regulations and laws that are also you know really problematic for users in that certain jurisdictions in, in, in a sense that how those states are interpreting those regulations you know and it's mainly uh, it's it's basically uh, uh, what they say is we are holding tech companies accountable because they are not really responding to us or you know they are not really re uh, uh, responding to our jurisdictions as opposed to the global north and which is true but at the same time the uh, the impact on uh, uh, those uh, regulations on uh, on users in more authoritarian regimes are actually multifold. So I think users in in global uh, majority and especially in conflict zones and in in authoritarian regimes are more vulnerable than users in other jurisdictions. You know they are they are uh, dependent on the platforms. At the same time, they are dependent on their governments. So so it's really you know like they are in a very tough spot i would like to mention a, a very small case um a mention of a case that we have just decided at the oversight board and it's basically you know like an example that we how much accountability we need for these companies so oversight board is just one example for meta and we do not do 
everything that is wrong with the company, right? It's only the content moderation decisions that we are making. But at the same time, how many other companies are actually holding themselves accountable or, or they, they have like self-regulatory models? No, they don't. And I think that's something that we also need to sort of push that besides regulations, besides uh, other things that are coming up to hold tech giants accountable, we need self-regulatory models as well, who, which are independent and which have actual powers to hold companies accountable accountable and tell them that what they are doing is actually wrong and you know the bsr report around palestine and uh, um, and israeli conflict is one example just two weeks ago we released a decision around uh uk drill music where uh you know the company turned to oversight boards saying that uh, uh the uk law enforcement met uh basically asked them to remove uh the video of the of a rapper um and it was originally removed uh from instagram and but then they came to us asking us you know how we can deal with such situations where law enforcement reach out to us and so what basically we decided the case and we raised our concerns about Meta's relationship with law enforcement, uh, which has the potential to amplify bias. So, so we made recommendations in that case as well with, re with respect to due process and transparency around these relationships. And it's not only with regard to that particular case, it applies to all the jurisdictions, which Mona has mentioned, which Tanzil ha has mentioned, that what, what, what are the, these relationships with the law enforcement, with the governments and how companies deal with this we you and i know at drf that how this happens in in our jurisdiction right so i think it's very important for us to keep holding these companies accountable that how uh, are they really transparent in those relationships how they are taking down content what requests they are basically accepting from the law enforcement and in that case we also found out that there was no reasonable threat that was raised by the UK police to Met Meta in in order to uh, take that con uh, content down. So and and uh, please go uh, to the website and read the read that the, that decision because we have given multiple recommendations to uh, to the company and raised our own concerns around these relationships with the law enforcement. Great, thank you. So, uh, Lishka, Nigit uh, just mentioned about how citizens from some countries are more just more heavily dependent on social media platforms in order to be able to uh, raise their voice, to protest, to seek support from other countries and governments. You know, because um, th their situation in their state is um, they're under attack, basically. So they're very reliant and dependent on these platforms, um, and. But tech companies, and we, as we've seen in uh, Russia, in the Russia and Ukraine situation, uh, they decide to pull out as a form of protest, um, you know, against the state's actions. So, what is uh, do you think? How they? What is the framework that can define that balance? You know, when they decide our actions are either helping those citizens there, or if pulling out uh, of, uh, you know, um, restricting our uh, operations in that particular country will actually be more beneficial uh, as a form of protest. Yeah, thank you for this question. Um, so I definitely agree that uh, especially when the countries find themselves in a situation of uh, crisis, whether that's armed conflict or other types of social unrest, platforms are often a last resort of any potential access to effective remedy, right to appeal, or just to make their voices heard. And that also covers the documentation of human rights abuses and human rights violations. If there is no other proper channels, how to actually access these information otherwise. And we gradually see as more and more international judicial bodies are relying on these type of evidence in order to establish the, that proper accountability. Uh, at the same time, I also agree that uh, state uh, is often the main perpetrator of violence and has a direct access to the Institute of Violence, and the consequences of that are obviously really severe. Um, so one way what platforms and companies can do in order to either manage that political and public pressure for them to leave the country or how to actually maybe avoid that last resort of escaping the country and i will repeat myself and that's very much what the declaration is also doing is to put in place certain measures uh, that will on one hand help them to understand the nature of that crisis and one a measure that is also specifically mentioned in the declaration are crisis protocols that platforms can develop even before again the crisis escalates so the 
these crisis protocols, uh, you know, then uh, should be deployed across all levels and likelihood of risks, and they should be designed to prevent and mitigate that potential harm uh, that will, of course, become more and more uh, gross once the uh, escalation of crisis or is fully blown. So, um, and there are a number of other human rights due diligence measures that uh, can be uh, put in place. When it comes to entering and or uh, leaving the market where platforms operate and where users are really reliable on them and they are becomes, they become sort of the life source of information, uh, they can also actually conduct risk assessments on those markets to understand what kind of countries and areas and regions and territories they're entering before they will start performing their operations there. And the same risk assessment measures should be put in place once they decide to leave the market. Because, of course, if they do so uh, without any sensitivity or proper understanding of the situation, that can also cause significant harm for individual users. And then there is a number of recommendations that also touch upon already mentioned business models of companies, right? So these data harvesting business models that are then, of course, translated also into their content governance policies, whether these are content moderation uh, systems or content recommender systems or simply ad tech revenue, which lies in the core of business models of these companies. Um, and of course, they are private companies. So by default, they often prioritize profit over the protection of human rights. And specifically, these, these special set of human rights due diligence safeguards that they can and should put in place uh, can also help to mitigate negative impact of uh, surveillance based advertisement, especially uh, if they operate in areas that are impacted by crisis. And we saw a couple of those examples also during the illegal invasion of Ukraine, when Russia specifically banned any uh, sort of advertisement activities of these platforms uh, in its territory, um, which is, of course, uh, sort of a very strong incentive to be used by states, uh, because that's pretty much going after that profitable activity or the main activity that these platforms have. Um, so uh, there are, of course, a number of other measures that can be put in place when uh, especially user empowering measures uh, in order to mitigate the negative impact of business models. Uh, transparency is one way how to go about it, but also giving more proactive tools to users and more uh, tools that will protect especially users at risk at times of crisis are essential. Um, and many of those are reflected in our declaration too. Thank you. Uh, we're very short on time, uh, but uh, Mona and um, Nintan Seal, I want to see if you have any closing remarks before we take any questions uh, from our audience. I can't agree more with what uh, Nigat and uh, Leska said, uh, especially in the time of crisis. Um, like I really, uh, I strongly agree with what Eleska said regarding how social media operates, uh, like when they knew about certain conflicts or certain contexts and they are not taking action on like until there is like invasion right now. And this is also, uh, unfortunately, it's also seen from a global south, a global north perspective. It matters only when it comes to the global north, but when it comes to the global south, it never matters for them. For example, Russia and Syria, like they have been in a, such situation for years and they've never allowed people of Syria to spread hate speech, violent speech against political leaders and president of Russia, unless it happened to Ukraine, which is really heartbreaking. And I don't think that uh, the way how social media operating is fair enough for all the users, which basically they claim to be an open space for everyone. So I do think that um, to use a social media or like at least to, to have an open space for everyone, we should uh, continue our advocacy effort because of course social media companies, they are not going to stand by the international law or the business and the human, human rights principles, with, which we as human rights defenders have been calling on them to take as a baseline in their work for years without like a real advocacy joining uh, like standing shoulder by shoulder by our allies in global south but also with uh, the progressive allies in the global north who also are calling for decolonizing the digital spaces de decolonizing the digital approach on how tech companies are working and how they are operating i think 
decolonizing it's not a cliche it, it could be a real word and it could be really useful in the context on how social media companies are operating but we should deal with that or, or we should implement that in a very careful uh, way not to repeat again uh, how the system or how social media or tech companies are operating, how the uh, regulations from the global north are set and then they are affecting people in the global south without even participating or without even thinking about people in the global south mm -hmm. or taking their context into consideration. Mm -hmm. I'll stop here, but like the decolonization is a whole topic that I think mm -hmm. we can continue talking about. Thank you. Okay. Tanzil, really quick, do you have anything to add? Um, I think uh, everyone has added what I uh, I think I was supposed to say, but the but uh, in the end, I'd, I'd like to add that, you know, uh, we are seeing some changes, you know, from maybe from if we go back four to five years, there was uh, this this content moderation was like people didn't uh, were not aware about their rights online. You know, if there was something was being removed online, it was just like you know people didn't care. I think uh, that that is that that perspective has changed and people are starting to question if if something you know unusual happens to them online. So uh, I think more more we need to more, we need to have more awareness and we need to have uh, you know real actions. Uh, to 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 you know to hold the governments accountable but because as as i i have been you know see, seeing from the past few years there are so many you know organizations like access now and many other organizations who have been you know are trying to collect uh, the data and, and trying to you know look at the impact that the internet shutdowns or the censorship and other such uh, you know uh, effects uh, other such things are impacting the the people online but there hasn't been much, um, you know, uh, impact. Uh, like the government has isn't, uh, you know, doing um, much uh, in, in this in this uh, area. I think that we we need to focus more on that so that people, um, you know, can you know have uh, some some free uh, space to speak. Uh, you know, who who don't have the space to you know uh, to to share. Um, their experiences or the, the information offline. Thank you. Thank you, Denzil. Uh, Bruna, who is with us um, at the venue, can you uh, can you please see if there's any questions and and our panelists would. Um... Of course. Hi, everyone. Um, just to see whether anyone would like to have ask any questions or just um, raise your hands. So far, no questions in the room, but um, yeah. Okay, um, so because we are exactly on time now and I don't want to uh, overextend it, if there's a next meeting in the room, um, again, if something, if, some, if anyone has anything, uh, just to add uh, very quickly at the end, um, please do so and uh, or we we can just end the meeting right here. Thank you everyone uh, so much for your contributions here. I think it was a very um, fruitful discussion. It's a very important discussion to be having. Um, and uh, Alishka, Nikhat, Monat, and Zeal, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Haira. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.